This is a reading from The Education of a Black Radical. I am Diami Bailey, the author. This is from the chapter Growing Up in Memphis. Within this little world, Papa lived around the corner from us on Stevens Place, a short block with no sidewalks that connected our street to the beginning block of the housing project. On the other side of our house was DA's little sundry store, Bailey Stan. And next to that was another cousin of sisters, Miss Verley, and her husband, Johnny Edwards. Mr. Johnny, as we called him, operated an auto and truck mechanic garage just down the street. Two or three men worked with him doing all sorts of repairs to cars, dump trucks, and other heavy vehicles. This small world sat within a three block radius of the stately grounds of Lemon College, a four year Negro college focused heavily on training teachers. The school later merged to become Lemon Owen College. It was a handsome cluster of buildings in a park-like setting that spoke of opportunity and pride. At the opposite intersecting end of Ford was William Street, on which sat the black-owned and staffed Terrell Memorial Hospital. I remember it as a neat white frame structure on a hill with a long front porch, where the nurses in their starched uniforms and crisp nursing caps moving purposely about the porch and grounds of the hospital gave me to understand that there were many avenues of opportunity open to blacks. In the same block of Williams in a second floor apartment lived the pop and rhythm and blues star, Johnny Ace, with his wife and children. He was a smooth, romantic crooner in the tradition of Nat King Cole and the, late, the later work of, John, of Sam Cooke. My father loved collecting records, and as a young teenager at night, I would sit on the floor next to one of the speakers of the stereo console, listening to Ace and other great musicians. In his late teens, Ace, one of the three brothers, supported himself cutting yards in the neighborhood. An old timer from Fort Place, Cleo Stocks, remembered Ace, earlier known as Johnny Alexander as argumentative and as someone who would, quote, take a chance on anything. Ace's career grew from Bill Streeters, an influential group that also nurtured B.B. King and Bobby Blue Bland. His life ended tragically at age 25 on Christmas Eve, 1954, when the burgeoning star shot himself in the head, playing Russian roulette backstage in Houston, Texas. Speaking of Ace's death, the longtime Fort Place resident said, quote, it's a wonder he didn't get killed around here. Ace's death drew me to the Lewis funeral home and I will remember standing at his casket next to the floral arrangement in the form of a clock. The flowers are reference to one of his biggest hits, the clock on the wall. Lovers of Johnny Ace transitioned from shock to adoration the next year with the posthumous release of what would be his biggest hit, Pledging My Love, which rose to the pop top 20 and spent 10 weeks at the top of the rhythm and blues charts. The jazz great Louis Armstrong had taken a liking to Ace, and the month after his death, Armstrong had recorded Ace's Pledging My Love as a tribute. Needless to say, for adolescents, our small world had its sexual challenges as well. I remember that in the ninth and 10th grade, homosexuality, as we later came to call it, was a fact of life in and outside the school. In our, little, in our little world, we were much easier with gay people than one might expect, given the contemporary hysteria over all things gay. There were two or three well-known homosexuals in the school who were popular and very open about their sexual orientation. But there was a predatory side to this even then. There was a quiet rumor that one or two of the more handsome and popular high school boys had sex with gays for money. We mostly felt that same-sex relations didn't compromise the manhood of the straight boy so long as it was just a lock. It is a simple reality that gay men have always found a more congenial environment in the South generally and in the black community particularly. 
who always knew that gays were among us and they were relatively welcome, eccentric characters. Of course, this all changed rather drastically with the advent of AIDS. Across the street from blues icon W.C. Handy's shotgun Memphis home, and three blocks in the opposite direction from us lived my maternal grandmother. We called her Big Mama. Nearby were my Uncle Albert and his family. And I remember the momentous event when they became the first family in the neighborhood to have a black and white television. As I think now about how we all crowded into their living room to cheer on the black championship boxers like Ezra Charles, Joe Lewis, and Jersey Joe Walcott, I realized that the television was a transformational force in our lives. It gave us electronic community. We black families were as one, cheering around thousands of televisions and radios across America. Somehow, without our understanding how it happened or why, our unbending resolve to fight for equality was nurtured in part in such communal gatherings around the television. This has been a reading from The Education of a Black Radical. I am Diami Bailey, the author. Thank you.